Hello, my name is Emmanuel Buttigieg. I am a senior lecturer in early modern history at the University of Malta. And today it's my pleasure to welcome you into the reading room of the National Library of Malta. This institution has been running a series of features on scenography and costumes in the past. And my contribution today is going to be looking precisely at what the Knights of St. John wore and how they related to clothes. It's my firm belief that clothes are a way in which people have always tried to communicate and hence I'm going to try and explore with you how the knights themselves related to this idea. Um, now, if you think about it, even today we, uh, we try and use our clothes as a way of communication and this is always evolving. For example, I've recently learned that you can wear clothes that have QR codes on them. QR codes, you've probably seen them. There are these little uh, black barcodes usually on objects. You would point your smartphone at them and you would get information. Well, these days you can have a t-shirt with a QR code so someone can point their smartphone at you and they will learn things about you. It seems that this is a way in which people date as well these days, unlike using the phone in my, as I used to do. Uh, but there's nothing new in that. The, um, a people known as the Scythians, who uh, lived in Central Asia between about 600 and 200 BC, they are known to have had very heavily tattooed bodies. A few years ago, there was a major exhibition about them at the British Museum in London, uh, where they explored this aspect, how the tattoos on their bodies told stories as their lives went on over the years. And in the same way, the knights would use their clothes to communicate things about them. And that is an aspect we're going to be exploring today. Starting off with their official outfit, what we would call the habit. They would refer to it as labito. And we're all familiar with this. It's the black outfit or the red one with the eight pointed cross on their chest. That's the official, let's call it uniform, the habit, labito. But then there's the other clothes that they also owned and wore. And that is a whole other aspect of their dimension. Now, a story that illustrates how, uh, how clothes could be used as part of the way that people communicated with each other, interacted with each other, uh, takes us to 1603, when an Italian knight, Fra Vincenzo Lo Monte, convinced a Muslim slave, her name was Aisha, to give him the sock of her master, who was also a knight. Why were they doing this? Well, Lomonte was interested in Aisha's friend, Francesca. Aisha was interested in trying to control her master. So it's a bit of a love triangle or rectangle almost. Um, why the sock? Well, Lomonte was going to take the sock to this old lady, known for her magical knowledge, and she would place a spell on the sock. It's what we call a binding spell. These kind of spells would bind the person's will to you. And that's why they're using a sock, because it's of course a very intimate object belonging to the particular knight. And this is how we start entering the world of this people. It's not just something you're wearing, but it's something about who you are and about something that you are trying to do. Now, an expression that we often hear is that the habit makes the monk or the habit does not make the monk. The idea is that, of course, identity uh, is reflected in what we wear, but also that identity should not be just skin deep. It should go, it should go further down. So, for example, we have here a book which was uh, written by Fra Marcantonio Zondadari. He would become a grandmaster a bit later, but when he wrote this book, uh, which was published in 1724, he wasn't yet grandmaster. Now, this book is called the Breve e Particolare Istruzione. So, it's a short handbook, in other words. Um, an A to Z sort of, and how to be a Knight of St. John. Such books were popular then just as much as they are popular today in their different versions. And what Don Dadari tried to do here is to explain 
what is necessary to be a knight and the habit was a particularly important element. In fact, he describes it, I'm translating here of course, as a great and glorious uniform which distinguishes us among the whole of Christendom. For Don Dadari, this was very important. It was the way in which um, you could distinguish yourself as belonging to the order of Malta. He made the point that the, uh, the black outfit with the eight-pointed cross, that cross symbolized the uh, beatitudes that Christ had preached in the, in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, there are many ideas about what the cross actually symbolized, but this was one of the most popular ones. And so Dadari goes on to say that that cross it is there because that, that is the way we are showing our obedience to, to God and that every man should carry his own cross. And, and here it's, you know, you're literally carrying the cross in the case uh, of the knights because of, of the garment that, that they are wearing. Um, now, rules about what knights should wear um, have been there from almost the beginning. Uh, there's a particular regulation that survives from their very early days in Jerusalem. We're talking all the way back to the 11th century. And this rule says that they should not wear brightly colored cloth, fair or fustian. There's always this emphasis, and we're gonna see it again and again, uh, about avoiding a lot of color and about avoiding certain fabrics which were felt to be too rich or too luxurious for men who take religious vows. And uh, we have an interesting example just over here in, uh, in the minutes of the Council of the Order of St. John. So the Council of the Order was the body which together with the Grand Master looked after the day-to-day -day running of the institution. And here we have a record of the things that they talked about. This is quite interesting because it's dated 4th April 1562. We're just three years away from the Great Siege of 1565. The Grand Master is, of course, the famous uh, Jean de Valette. And uh, there's a whole paragraph here talking about the clothes of the knights. And it's a very interesting description that, that they give here. And, and I'm going to read it out because I think it captures wonderfully the, the, uh, the ideas that, that governed their, their thinking. So it says that in view of the current abuse among the brothers and religious of the order, in relation to their wearing clothes of many colors, again the problem with color, many colors and varied styles and fashions, which are not suitable or licit for their profession and habit, and wishing that in future there should be a greater adherence to the honesty that conforms with the statutes of the order, they, that's the council, have instructed that after June, no religious of any grade or position should dare to wear a cape, mantle, or doublet, or any other garment of two or more colors, or with silk or thread of a color different from that of his outfit. So again, you can see a lot of emphasis on the issue of color. Clothes at this time were made in such a way that you could actually sort of build them up with lots of components. So it was fairly easy that you could have different colors in your outfit. But as you can see from this injunction, the, the order was being quite adamant that you should not have a lot of color because color somehow was not equatable to honesty which is what every knight uh, should be. Um, it's also interesting that they're giving um, a window of opportunity, as it were, because this prohibition was April, uh, but they have till June to dispose of clothes that don't fall within the lines of this regulation. Now, that's very telling as well. Fabric was expensive. In fact, um, historians that specialize in the study of clothes and fabric tell us that often it was a better investment to have clothes and fabric than to have a lot of cash because clothes retain or fabric retains its value. So 
when they're telling, when the council is telling the knights, well, you have to get rid of these clothes, um, they, they would have had too much of a reaction had they told them to get rid of them, you know, to, uh, tomorrow. They gave them almost two, three months to do so, so that hopefully they would have enough time to sell them and get back as much as they could of, of their money. Um, now, these ideas that we're seeing in that regulation back in Jerusalem, that we're seeing in what the Valet uh, is ordering here, um, reflect very strongly the ideas of a particular knight called Fra Sabba Castiglione. And we have his book here. Fra Sabba was um, a member of the order who wrote this book known as the Ricordi. The, well, there's different ways of translating that. It could be the thoughts, it could be the memories, it could be the ideas. They all fit the spirit of, of this particular book. Now, um, who was our friend Fra Sabba? Well, he was a cousin to a very famous um, Renaissance figure, Baldassare Castiglione. Baldassare Castiglione wrote a book called Il Libro del Cortegiano. Again, this is another of those how-to books. If you wanted to be a successful gentleman at the court of a prince, and this is what, of course, uh, any member of the elite or anyone who was trying to come up in the world was aspiring to, uh, Il Libro del Cortegiano was the guidebook of how to do it. How to go into the hall, how to genuflect, how to eat, it's all of these details. What we have here is the book of the cousin, Sabba Castiglione, who is a member of the order, a very educated man. And the Ricordi are the version, in a sense, of the Libro del Cortegiano, customized for a member of the Order of St. John. That's why it's so wonderful. And the other little bit which makes it quite nice for me is that it has a dedication to the nephew, uh, Bartolomeo, who was also a member of the Order. This is a very common relationship in the order, which has not really been studied yet, the uncle and nephew. Because it's quite common that within a family you're going to find the uncle and the nephew, sometimes in the same period of time, uh, be, being members. This, this was a case. So what does he do in, in the recording? Well, he tells any aspiring member how you prepare yourself to join the order and what you do once you are a member of the order. It's very popular, it went through a number of, of uh, prints and, and editions of, over time. When it comes to clothes, he has quite a lot to say about clothes, in fact, the message is very similar to what we saw in the uh, injunction or, or order from, from the council. Uh, avoid colours, avoid luxury, avoid materials like silk, because they're not very becoming for someone who is a member of, of the order. And let me just quote you a little bit from what Castiglione had to say, because again, it's very telling. It really shows us how, base, how these people think. So, Sabba said, Since morning is the most useful and precious part of the day, you will rise early. And in dressing up, putting on your shoes, adorning and bedecking yourself, you will be quick, brief and make haste. And because man is a political animal, I want you to ensure your body is limpid and neat, especially your mouth, hands and feet. But then I do not want you to be delicate and weak. You will avoid perfumes, which are more adequate for vain and graceful women, apologies to the ladies, and for lascivious and effeminate men, than for a religious knight such as yourself. And always remember the ancient proverb that he who is always perfumed does not always do what is good. I like this last point. He goes on to say, When dressing up and putting on your shoes, you will disdain every superfluity and all vain pomp. You will always be grave, modest and pure. You will avoid silk stuffs, hems, lacerations, stripes, slashes, cuts, adornments, embroideries, and similar vanities, and the, con and the nonsense of this corrupt and dumb world, because such things are not pertinent to your state 
and condition. Now, as you will have noticed, Sabba Castiglione um, showed a detailed, but somehow I feel also a little bit of a sarcastic knowledge of, uh, of, of fashion. Again, I'll, I'll quote a little bit. So he talks about the silk stuffs, the hems, the lacerations, the stripes, the slashings, the cuttings, the adornments, the bro embroidery. Um, now, what he's showing us here is um, what historians of fashion like to call the tension between the draped and the soon. What do they mean by this? So, from about the 14th century, um, we see more tight-fitting clothes starting to become more in use, both for men and women, but especially for men. Uh, in other words, clothes are starting to be not just free-flowing kind of robes, but shirts and let's call them sort of trousers, no, not exactly trousers, but something around your legs, which are hugging the body more intimately, and which therefore are, of course, they are covering the body, but in a sense, they're also revealing the body but by the fact that they are more tight fitting. Um, this is a time, remember, when you don't have things like the zipper or Velcro, so the ways in which clothes are, are, are kept together are either by sewing on or, or buttons and lots of strings as well. And this is what uh, Sabba is talking about when he's talking of the hems, the lacerations, um, the, the, the cuttings. It's all the ways in which clothes come together. It's a bit like a puzzle in, in, in effect. It, it did take a bit of work to get dressed, especially, of course, for those classes who, who could afford it. Uh, now, in the case of the hospitalers, the members of the order, what I see is a bit of a tension between this idea of uh, the draped and the soon. In one sense, again, if we look at the injunction of De Vallette and what the Castellon is saying, they're saying, you know, you really should be wearing the habit of the order. The idea of the draped, therefore something a bit more loose fitting. But as we shall be seeing um, further on, there's a lot of members who like nice clothes. Clothes that are very tight fitting, that are soon. And it's always a bit of a battle of wits between regulations that don't want these kinds of clothes, but the reality being that they like wearing them. And of course, there's nothing new if you just think of the relationship between a parent and a child, no? no you can't wear that, but of course I'm gonna wear it. it it's something, something like that. Now, uh, in this particular edition that the National Library has of Sabba's book, we actually have an image of him at the front, um, which is quite wonderful. And we see him as a very typical mid-16th century scholar in his robe. So he is uh, in that category that we've defined as, as the draped. Uh, he's surrounded by books. There's a little Latin inscription which says, Dirige Domine Sinistra Meam in Laude Tua, that is, God direct my left arm in your praise. Um, he was a left-handed individual which he wanted to, to point out. Uh, but despite being a scholar, it's also very clear that he's a member of a military religious order, the Knights of St. John. He has the eight-pointed cross hanging uh, on a chain on his chest. There's a sword and there's also a rosary bead. So it's a wonderful way in which these, these many identities of the order come, come together. Yes, he's a scholar, but he's a particular kind of scholar. And his clothes are reflective of this particularity of, of the status that, that he occupies. Um, and he's not the only example of someone who through their clothes are telling us who they are. There's a wonderful diary from the early 17th century belonging to a Spanish man called Alonso de Contreras. He was, um, he became a, a servant at arms in the order of St. John. And that's roughly the third category in the order, you know, because he had knights, he had chaplains, had the priests, and you had the servant at arms. So he was a servant at arms because he was a noble born, so he couldn't be a knight, so he's a servant at arms. And there's this wonderful bit in his diary when he is in Madrid in 1613, and 
He says the following in his diary. Here I stayed in Madrid wearing my habit. Oh, it's very clear. He's wearing the habit with the eight-pointed cross. And everyone gave me their congratulations. You know, people saw it, they recognized it, and they said, you know, well done. You know, good chap, as it were. Everyone gave me their congratulations. This is the nice part. Some out of envy, others out of love. Well, we've all experienced this. Sometimes people tell us, oh, well done, but somehow you know they don't quite mean it, actually. And, and Contreras uh, reflects on, on this aspect. But what's nice is the fact that he acknowledges that as he enters the city, he goes into a room or somewhere, people see him with this habit, the eight-pointed cross, and they know who he is, or, or at least to what he belongs, straight away. Now we have been talking a lot about the habit and a very important ritual in the life of someone who was going to join the order was precisely the ritual through which one actually received the habit. Um, this was a ritual that would usually happen in a church setting. Um, it was a religious ritual, of course indicating that we're always talking of a religious organization. And in that ritual, which we can call the investiture ritual, the candidate is going to have the habit physically put on him. It would have been quite an elaborate show um, to, to watch. Now, why was this important? Well, in the 16th century, when you had the Council of Trent, which was this great council of the church through which they were responding to the challenge of Protestantism, but also trying to find ways to take the church into the future, uh, the Council of Trent actually did spend some time talking about the importance of the religious habits in general and of course that applied to the Order of St. John. So the Council of Trent said that though the habit does not make the monk, and it's, it's interesting that you find it in the minutes of the Council of Trent, though the habit does not make the monk, clerics must nevertheless always wear the clerical dress appropriate to their order so that they may show by the suitability of their outward dress, the interior uprightness of their character. So again, we're back to this point of how the exterior is related to the interior. And again, I remind you, we, we talked about how colors were not appropriate. Well, that's because too much color seems to indicate a very frivolous nature inside you. And that, you know, the Council of Trent is making that very clear. Um, we talked about how Contreras in Madrid um, received people's congratulations for wearing the habit, but not everyone loved the habit of the Knights of Malta. We know that the Venetians were particularly uh, irritated by the behavior of the Knights, because whereas Venice wanted to trade with the Ottomans and the Muslims, the Knights wanted to wage war on them, and of course these two often clashed, so the Venetians and the Hospitallers often had problems, and uh, there's a minute in the, in the records of the Senate of Venice where they say that the knights were nothing but corsairs parading crosses. In other words, the habit is, is, is a falsehood, they're saying. It's only covering their deceiving nature. They're really corsairs, pirates. They're not really doing it for God. They're doing it for the money. Uh, that's the Venetian point of view. I would say that in general, however, many people in Europe tended to see the habit of the knights in, in a positive manner, that they admired it. And, and that's why it made its way into books like, like the one that I have here. This is quite a wonderful piece that the National Library uh, possesses. It's called Catalogo degli Ordini Equestri e Militari. So the catalog of um, knightly and military orders, and it was compiled by a Jesuit scholar called Filippo Bonanni. So again, we're back to this idea of this sort of A to Z or, or guide. Uh, here he collected a record uh, up to about um, 1711 of all the military knightly orders that existed or had existed up to that point. Because one has to remember that there's always been a lot of these orders. Um, the Knights of St. John are certainly one of the oldest and best known, but there's, there's a lot of these, even these days. And in the catalogo, Bonanni includes uh, three or four images related specifically to the order of 
St. John. And they're very high quality images that, that he has. He starts with an image of the Grand Master, uh, which, which we see here, a, a very beautiful rendering of the habit of the Grand Master. We see him with the famous uh, berretto, the hat that was typical of the Grand Master. Remember, although he is a Grand Master and because being in Malta, he's the prince of the island, they never actually wore a crown because they, they could not, although they might include it in paintings. But they did wear the berretto, which was their symbol of office. And sometimes you have occasions where if there's a, a protest against a Grand Master, for example, in the 1630s against Lascaris, when he wanted to tone down the level of, of carnival celebrations, we know that a crowd of knights went in front of the palace, uh, Piazza San Giorgio, as we call it these days, and they were shouting, Fuori Berrettone, out with the one with the, with the hat, no? So the hat is, of course, a symbol of, of the office. Um, then we have an illustration, a rather beautiful one, of what was called the Grand Cross. The Grand Cross was a very high-ranking knight. Um, and usually you would have to be at least a Grand Cross to become a, a Grand Master. Um, they were, again, this very elaborate costume, uh, and about which I'll be saying a few more things further down the line. Then you have the priest of the order, so that category who took care of the religious life. So these are the men you would have found in St. John's Church, the Church of Our Lady of Victory, and such other places. And the final image that he includes is that of a knight. He uses the expression in Latin, Eques Melitensis, Knight of Malta, in bello, that is a knight ready for war. These are uh, monochrome images, but the fact that he says in bello uh, tells us that the habit which we see him wearing here would have been the red one, just the red one they wore it when they went into battle. But what's again nice about this one is that he has the habit, but we can clearly see the habit is sort of flying a little bit in the air, there seems to be a breeze. Um, Clearly, then, he has these very fashionable clothes underneath. We're just getting a glimpse of them, a tantalizing glimpse. And he also has this very fashionable sword that, that, he's, that he's bearing. Now, what Bonanni does is that besides including, in Latin and Italian, in fact, this is a bilingual guide, uh, besides including the images of the members, and he has a little explanation, so this is a grandmaster, this is what he wears, this is the priest, this is what he wears. He also thought that you would, have, you would need a little history of the order to make sense of these. And he also thought you would need an explanation of how you actually get to wear the habit of the order. So once again, we have details about the investiture ritual. And uh, I'm, I'm keeping you a little bit in suspense about this because we're going to get to it. Now we're, we're building towards this wonderful ritual, which was um, the... Uh, the putting on of the habit of the order. Now, this is a beautiful printed uh, work about this, but it's not the only one that would have talked about the investiture ritual. Um, here in the National Library, we have a number of, of examples of these kinds of works, uh, some in manuscript form and some in printed published form. And again, this is interesting because of course, you know, by the 16th, 17th, even the 18th century, the printing press by that point is a well-established mechanism. Books are easily published. But nevertheless, people still find it useful in some cases to write things with their hands and actually distribute them as manuscript. That's what manuscript means, after all, no? something written um, by, by the hand. Um, and so we, uh, we've got over here a manuscript uh, example which is uh, a set of instructions for, for different knights. And it's called, in the Italian, Riflessioni di un Cavaliere di Malta. The Reflections of a Knights of Malta. It's quite a long title. Then it ends with Sopra la Grandezza e Doveri del Suo Stato. So about you know, the greatness of being or, or how cool it is to be a knight, 
and the duties that, that come with it. And then if we go inside uh, the volume, he has quite a few pages, or folios to use the technical term, in which he is talking about the whole process of how the investiture ritual is going to work. Uh, it's not the only example. We have another one from the collection of the National Library. Um, and again, it tells, it tells us um, sul gentiluomo, about the gentleman, che vuole entrare nella religione di San Giovanni, who wants to become a member of the order. Now, if you look at it, at first you might think this is printed, but in fact it's handwritten. But you know, clearly this individual had a, an amazing calligraphy and he was able to, to really create something beautiful. And when you look inside it, um, after the first few folios or pages, it takes the shape of a question and answer, because that was an important part of the ritual of investiture. Um, you would have the person leading this, they would usually call him the Dante, the giver, so he's indicated with a D, and then you would have the recipiente, the receiver, and he's indicated with an R, so D and R are talking to each other. Uh, so D, the giver, is asking a question, you know, are you ready to be a good man and follow the rules? The receiver will answer, yes, 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 of course. <laughs> Otherwise, they don't let him in. Uh, so the impression is that they would have had to, if not memorize this whole thing, because it's, it's a bit long to actually memorize, but probably they would have had it at hand to, to help them uh, in, in this whole, whole ritual. Now, we are again very lucky that the National Library has an example of one of my favorite, certainly, uh, productions by the Order. Um, but I think it's fair to say it's one of the most beautiful books that the Order has produced. The work I am referring to is called the Statuta Hospitalis Jerusalem, published in 1588. What was it? Grandmaster Verdal was the reigning Grandmaster. Um, when he came to power, he had come into power in a very difficult situation because just before him there had been an internal, uh, almost mini civil war between uh, the Grandmaster La Cassier and the famous Romegas. This um, quarrel nearly broke the order apart. Uh, and Verdal came in then as the new Grand Master to heal these wounds and take the institution forward. And that is why Verdal invested so much in building well, Verdal a, a castle in, in, in Busquet, um, the work in the palace in Valletta, including uh, the commissioning of a lot of artists to produce some of the most beautiful works we, we still have, uh, like Palladini. Um, because he was a firm believer that iconography, what we see, is important in pushing the message of discipline, which is what, what he was after. Now, as part of this, he calls a chapter general, which is the most important council of the order. The chapter general revises the statutes, that's the regulations governing the order. And as was typical, they were published in order, of course, to disseminate them because there's no point in doing something unless, of course, people know about it. And at this time, the best, no, the best way was to, to publish. But he didn't limit himself to just producing a book with words. This is a book which is richly illustrated. And they got, again, top of the range uh, individuals to produce the plates that we see in this book. And, and they are extremely high quality. Now, among the various reproductions that we see here, the one that I want to refer to as we move deeper in, in this ritual of, of the investiture um, is the image that is just before the chapter, which is called De Recezione Fratrum, that is, on how we receive our brothers. The book works always like this. So on the left, you have the image, and on the right would be the title of the chapter that, that one is going to, to be reading. 
which is, in, which is all in Latin. Now, the images have tended to capture the, the attention because this volume is so beautiful in, in the images that, that it contains. Um, at the top, you always have a Latin inscription. Uh, in this case, it reads, I'll, I'll translate it because the Latin is quite heavy actually to, to, to pronounce, um, but it says something on the lines that here the individual is being clothed um, with a new identity. Uh, it's a little play on a letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians, which we've often probably heard in church, but perhaps not always paid enough attention to, where St. Paul is saying that to be a Christian, you literally have to wear God. And here we're saying that the habit is the way in which you're going to, to wear God. Um, now, the image has all these wonderful details that, that we can go over a little bit together. We see a lot of candles. The candle is, of course, there to indicate the importance of light, the light of God that is uh, enlightening the darkness of, of this world. We have the, the Dante that we referred to a little bit earlier, the one who is presiding over the ceremony. Uh, he would have been probably a Grand Cross himself, or certainly a high-ranking individual in the order. He's the one who is delivering the habit. Uh, and in this case, we see actually three individuals who are kneeling, who are all going to receive the habit. A nice little detail when one focuses on the image is that the, uh, the Dante is sitting on a throne or a chair. And this chair, uh, the, the, uh, the, the feet of the chair are actually paw, the paws of a lion. Now, this was very symbolic and meaningful because the lion, of course, is a powerful creature, indicating even further how, how important uh, this, this, this figure is. Um, we have men here, these are all men, of course, um, who are of different ages. And that's also, again, an interesting f f factor. So roughly in the middle um, to the left of the altar, there's a, a quite a young boy, and he's holding a book open in his arms. Now, next to him is a priest. So he's either holding up that book for the priest, or that could actually be something like the guide that I talked about a bit earlier on, the Q&A, to help uh, the, the, the new members uh, to get through this very long ritual. I think it would have taken more than an hour and probably even more than that to get through all of this, because besides the Q&A, you also have a mass uh, and you have all this standing up and sitting down and genuflecting. It, it's a good thing you were young, in fact, because it needed a little bit of exertion to go through the whole thing. Um, there's a lot of swords. The sword, of course, is a very important accessory for members of, of the order. Um, among them, there's a sword which is being held up high, um, indicating that this is a military religious order that these men are entering into a, a military kind of life. The new members themselves are wearing these long flowing robes. Again, it's, it's telling us that they are the, uh, the draped, no? that they're wearing these, these, these clothes that don't quite show off uh, their bodies. But then we do see others in the picture who are wearing these very tight-fitting leggings, for example. Uh, the calves of a man were considered to be particularly important in showing that he was a strong, uh, strappy kind of individual. A small detail that we see here, which is also very telling, is that we see a knight who is kneeling behind uh, the three young aspirants, and he's holding uh, spares. Uh, these, these things that, that a rider would wear, of course, to, to encourage a horse to, to move forward. Now, we know that the spares were made of gold. This has two purposes. First of all, this is a knightly order, so the, a man would be expected to know to, how to ride a horse. Even though, of course, our knights are mostly fighting at sea, but nevertheless, these are guys who would have been almost born and bred on a horse, so they would have known how to manage 
uh, that animal. But the, the spear is made of gold on purpose because of course you're gonna wear it on your feet. And that's a way of saying that you will shun the riches of this world. So yes, you're a knight, but you're supposed to be a holy kind of knight. Now, there are other um, books, manuscripts that continue building up on, on this. Again, we have a very nice example here in the National Library. Um, this time in Spanish. And you'll excuse my poor Spanish pronunciation, but I think it gives a little flavor as well. It's the Orden y Modo de Armar Caballero e di Dar el Abito. And it continues. But basically it's saying, you know, this is the order and procedure in which you give the habit. And again, it's in manuscript form. Again, very beautifully written. Again, you have this Q and A, so similar to the one that we saw. Um, but this is intended for a Spanish audience. In fact, we know that it was presented by a commander called Fra Don Tomas Sarsuela, and he was presenting it to the Castellani of Amposta. The Castellani of Amposta was part of the Lang of Aragon, Catalonia, and Navarre. And in fact, on that note, we will now be moving to the chapel that was used by the Lang of Aragon, what we call uh, the, the Church of Our Lady of Pilar, because there we're going to explore a little bit more how this, uh, this ritual of investiture would have worked out in a setting that recalls very much uh, the places where these rituals happened. We're now in the beautiful setting of the Church of Our Lady of Pilar on West Street, the lower part of West Street in Valletta. This church was uh, the church used by the Knights of the Lang of Aragon. And we've come here because this helps us to get a sense of the environment within which the investiture ritual would have taken place. I'm not going to refer to a specific case, but you have to imagine that everything that I've said and I will be saying would have happened in this kind of beautiful uh, setting. And to help us further understand uh, what it would have been like, I'm going to refer to a manuscript which is in Portuguese and it's called the Modo e Ordem, similar to others we've seen now, the, the way and the method. The Modo and Ordem um, was a text in Portuguese which was again intended to help people understand how you do the process of the investiture. It was presented to the Priory of Portugal, which was part of the Lang of Castile, Leon in Portugal, and it was presented by Fra Raimondo de Souza da Silva and Fra Don Francesco Saverio de Morim e Souza. Again, the Portuguese names tend to be very long. Now, this manuscript is handwritten. It contains instructions about how the process happened, again with the question and answer that I mentioned earlier. But what is wonderful about it is that it has these color illustrations. Now, they're very crude. They're, they're not what you'd call high or refined art, but they're important because they bring, the, they bring us close to the reality of these kinds of rituals. The manuscript itself is found in the National Library of Portugal, and we're very grateful to them for permission for uh, reproducing these and, and showing them during the lecture. And I first got to know about it through the website of the Malta Study Center, which is based in the United States. Uh, their website, vhimmel.org, has a description of, of this manuscript. And you can actually download the PDF of the manuscript from the National Library of Portugal's website. That's a great benefit when libraries digitize their collections. So what do we have? As you can see, it is a church setting just like the one where we are today. You have the Dante, the person presiding over the ceremony, and you have the individual who is going to be received into the order. These two are wearing the habit of the order, the black robe. 
But then we've got these three gentlemen in these beautiful costumes again. One is sort of uh, reddish brown, the other is blue, the other is a kind of green. It's not clear that they are members of the order, but from the text that accompanies this, we know they would have been members of the order. And the person who is kneeling is the one who wants to join the order. And we see the individual who is in the blue outfit, who is holding, again, a pair of spares. These spares would have been placed on the feet of the new, uh, of the applicant, symbolizing, of course, uh, both the chivalrous nature of the order and the rejection of the idea of wealth. They're all wearing wigs, and one of them even has a very fashionable bow in, in, on his head. And in fact, we, we have a, a further sort of close-up here of, of all of these details. Uh, habit, wig, spare, colorful clothes, the bow and the hair. All elements that come together to define these, these Portuguese uh, gentlemen. Another image that we have from this manuscript, um, it's quite a fun image in a way, it, it shows the moment in the ritual. And incidentally, do notice that there is an altar in the background, just as I have, in fact. It's the moment in the ritual when the mantle is being placed upon the candidate. We have the candle once again, source of light, and the mantle is sort of lifted high up and then comes, I think gently anyway, on, on the candidate. And we see it in more detail, in fact, uh, here. It's this idea that this is completely covering the person. He knelt as a man, he will rise as a knight of St. John. That is very much uh, the point of, of this particular image. The final one that I want to uh, look at, um, which has these wonderful details in it. So again, we have the candidate uh, kneeling. Now he's been robed. He is holding the candle, so it's passed on from the person who was helping in the ceremony to, well, he's almost a knight at this point. It's, it's a build up. We notice that the uh, the Dante has the book. It's either the Missal or the Q&A book that we refer to. And then you've got these two gentlemen here. One in a very beautiful red outfit, the other in a sort of brownish outfit, again wearing wigs. The detail that I, I want to really focus on, however, is their shoes. They're wearing these colorful high heels, red high heels. Now this is an intricate and, and interesting detail. Um, the high heel had originated centuries before in Central Asia. It was used by um, horse riding warriors because it helps to control better the, 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 the horse. Gradually, it arrives into Europe, and during the 17th century, it becomes a very important fashion accessory, and especially Louis XIV of France had popularized the idea of a high red heel. And this document is from the early 18th century, so um, it's still in the reign of Louis, or just after it, and it shows us how these Portuguese gentlemen are very much in line with the fashion of the time. They are knights, but they are still following the fashions of the time. In a few years, this will go out of fashion. The heel will become smaller for men, although they will still use it, of course. But this high red heel really captures a very particular moment, the end of the 17th, the beginning of the 18th century. And so again, in this magnificent setting, you have the people who are draped, the ones receiving the habit and so on, and the people who are soon, who are wearing these fashionable outfits. And they both represent spectrums of what it meant to be a knight of St. John. So far, we've talked mostly about the habit, although I have been alluding to um, other clothes. Also, when I was referring to Bonanni, how although he's showing the knight with the habit, 
that habit seems to be flowing up with the wind and we can see a little bit of hints of clothes underneath. And uh, one way of knowing what they actually wore, what the knights actually wore on a day-to-day -day basis, is to look at the inventories that the National Library has, which are preserved in, in what we call the AOMs, the Archive of the Order of Malta. Now, because the, the knight was a member of a religious organization, um, he, he was expected to keep track of his belongings. Remember that they took a vow of poverty. Now, the vow of poverty had a very particular understanding in the order. It did not mean that you had to live the life of a pauper, because that would not have been becoming for someone of their status. But what it meant was that the individual throughout his life owned practically nothing. He enjoyed the use of it, but he didn't actually own it. And that's why the importance of these inventories, because they were a way of keeping track of things. Because when you died, most of your possessions, four-fifths, would go to the order. You had the, the uh, right that one-fifth, and they called it the quinto precisely, you could bestow on who you wanted, but four-fifths, the majority, would go to the order. Now, there were two kinds of, of these uh, inventories. Uh, there was what we call the dispropriamento. So this is an inventory you were expected to make every so often when you were alive. Now, as with, as with rules and regulations, not everyone was always on the dot with them, but quite a few actually survive. Um, and, and that's what we're going to be seeing here. Uh, but then when you died, an official from the treasury would come in and make an official inventory, as it were. And I suppose they would want it to actually compare, no? Um, and that was called a spolio. A lot of these spolies today you would find, for example, in the archive of the cathedral uh, in Imdina. But also you will find both uh, dispropriamenti and spolie uh, in archives across Europe as well, because of course many knights did not live in Malta, they lived elsewhere. So if they died outside of Malta, we might have a copy here, and we do have some of them, but probably it's in an archive in Florence and Rome and, and so on. Um, I want to show one, just as a case study. Uh, again, it's wonderful that the National Library has a, a, a respectable collection of, of these inventories. Uh, anyone interested in what we call material culture uh, just, just loses him or herself in these, so the, the wonderful details they have. This is the dispropriamento, the inventory, of a German knight called Fra von Schonow. I hope my German is, is good enough. Um, and in fact, it was a former student of mine, Vanessa Bohajar, who first kind of studied it, and she has a lovely study about German knights in general. His full name was Fra Franz Anton Baron von Schonow, bailiff of Brandenburg. The Germans in particular tend to have very long names and very long titles. Uh, the dispropriamento is particularly long. Um, it starts with the gold. It goes on to the clothes. Biancheria, uh, intimate wear, I suppose we would call it. Um, and then this was arranged room by room, which again, it's not very common. So I, that's why it's, it's a very interesting document. So you have mobili della sala, the furniture of, one assumes, the main room. Uh, mobili della prima camera, the furniture. The, so you, you can almost walk into his house, this, 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 this gentleman. That, that's what makes it so, so wonderful. And it goes on. It's, it's, a, it's a couple of pages long, in, in, in fact. It's, it's a very rich one. Uh, now, what I want to focus on among this wonderful variety um, are the clothes and fashion accessories. And, and I have to thank two experts who also helped me with this, Caroline Tonna, an expert on clothes, and Francesca Balzan, an expert on jewelry and accessories, because uh, they helped me to understand some of the things that, that one comes across here. So, we start off by noting that he did possess um, the cloak of the order and the cloak of a grand cross. Uh, and what is defined as a cloak for the council. So this is the habit. This is what he's wearing for official business. When he's riding off to go to the palace, 
uh, here in Valletta, he would have worn these. We also have a little note saying that at this point in his life, he actually owed 50 scudi to a textile merchant. Again, this is quite common in inventories. They tell us not only what they own or what they're using, uh, but people that they owe money to. And they're usually cloth, um, cloth merchants, um, as well as to tailors and, and seamstresses. And, and sometimes we're lucky to have their names as well uh, in, in these records. Then we move to other clothes, and this is what really interests me. So, for example, he owned a black leather coat um, with an undervest of something called grudetun. Now, grudetun seems to have been a very fine and soft fabric made from the palm leaf of the grugu, which is a plant in the West Indies. And this is wonderful, it's really telling us how interconnected the world already is. Here, here we're in the early 18th century with, with, with this. Uh, he has a black outfit with slips of black brocade. Slips, one of those things that our friend Sabba Castiglione condemned, in fact, that he should not have had. A cinnamon-coloured felt outfit with slips of damask. Again. Um, a coffee-coloured jacket with gold ornaments and a matching hat. No, he, he knew his stuff. A loose jacket of light white material. Colour. An outfit of black camlet fabric with a hat and two wigs. I'm going to come to the wigs in a moment. Something called a white slip with Spanish chevron stitch. This is very high-end stuff. Three pairs of black leather socks or light shoes. Um, calzette could have meant both, in fact. Both a, both a, both a sock, in fact, we still use calzetta in Maltese. Uh, but it could also mean these sort of light shoes, very, very refined kind of shoes. Uh, and a pair of cinnamon-coloured socks or light shoes uh, one, once again. And then again, he tells us that he, he had shirts, under breeches, cravats, cuffs, night neckbands, something he put on to sleep, socks of various materials, hats, a pair of white Gallipoli cotton socks. Well, that's quite, quite interesting too. Um, buckles, sort of clips to put on your shoes, a sword with a hilt of gold, so probably more ceremonial than practical. A walking stick with a gold handle, you can picture him. An octagonal cross with its necklace made up of four strands. A pair of shirt buttons made of enamel set in gold. A ring mounted with a turquoise gem. A pair of buttons for a shirt made with French gemstones inlaid with silver and a pocket watch with its own silver case. You, we're, we're so far away from the simplicity of that regulation that, that we saw earlier, of what Castiglione is, is saying. Um, he had a telescope, he had a gun, he had bows for hunting. Now, these are not strictly clothes, but it's what I, I consider to be accessories, things that he would have put on um, to accompany his, his look. And, and then we come to the thing that I find particularly interesting, the wigs. Um, we're in the 18th century. The fashion at this point is for men to shave their hair, but then wear wigs. And a man like Fra von Chanot would have had a number of, of these wigs. In fact, um, I counted, I think, three or four of, of, of wigs. Um, and there's accessories that go with them, which is interesting. So there's two wigs that are listed further up. And then we have, I'll say it in Italian because it's quite wonderful, tredici berrettini per sotto la pilucca. You needed some sort of contraption to actually put on your head, which would hold the wig uh, in, in, in place. And then, una testa per pilucche, a mannequin head. You don't just throw this wig, which is expensive anywhere. He actually had a mannequin head upon which he rested it for when he's not using it. 
Um, and he tells us that this mannequin head was located in the ante room of the house. In other words, it's the first room as you come in or the last room as you're going out because, I mean, Malta is Malta. This is a warm, hot, humid place. I don't think wigs were particularly comfortable. But so it's the last thing you put on before you go out and the first thing you want to chuck off when you come into the house. And he tells us that he had another three wigs and boxes specifically made in which he stored these wigs. Um, now, what uh, these are all fascinating in themselves, but what they tell us all together, what the story is here, is that this is a, a vocabulary, a sartorial vocabulary. These are all things that are attachable, detachable. It's ways in which an individual of that stature could change his look. Because fashion, of course, has always existed. It may not have been as fast as it is in our own day, but it is part of the language in which people relate to each other, including, if you were, a knight of St. John. So we started from a bewitched sock uh, and we ended with an assortment of, of wigs. All of these constituted elements that made the identity of a knight of Malta. Now, uh, there have been important works published on the subject of clothes in Malta. Um, we have works by Giuseppe Sarpolicino um, from a folkloristic point of view. A few years ago, Fondazione Patrimonio Malti made one of their wonderful exhibitions, Costume in Malta, and they produced the book that, that went with it. And for me, it's, it's sort of important because it was one of the exhibitions that I think really got me on the path that I took eventually in, in life. So the importance for young people to go to these exhibitions, for parents to take their children, because they, they lay the seed which, which then flowers. And, and more recently, a work by Heritage Malta on peasant costumes. Um, so we do have a, a wonderful historiographical basis upon which we can keep on building. It's important that we relate our studies to a very vibrant international uh, community of scholars working on clothes and fashion. And I will just conclude with a quotation by a French knight, Fra uh, Jean-Baptiste Le Mariner de Chani, with the habit of a knight, one came to be dressed up as a new man. The habit was a transformative experience. You knelt as a boy, you rose as a man, as a knight of St. John. But underneath the habit, there's another wonderful world to explore, which was equally important to the identity of these men. <laughs>